You may have been a little intrigued by the title of this little lecture, Band Gap Engineering. This is something that's done with alloy materials, and so the distinction between alloy and compound might be something you want to look into. I give you a little web resource here under the further readings. Alloys are combinations of multiple elements in a solid solution. Even most of them are metallic elements. One of the elements is the base, and everything else is dissolved into it, and then it's solid. As opposed to a compound, which is described by the bonds between all of the constituent elements. Semiconductor alloys are especially useful in optoelectronics, where you may need to adjust the band gap and you need a, a way to control it. And so it's controlled with the alloying ratio. And they're also very useful in high speed transistors such as HEMTs, high electron mobility transistors, HEMT, which we will be talking about a lot later, also known as ModFETs. Let's just begin now with some examples of alloy semiconductors and how the band gap can be adjusted with them. So here's the first one, indium gallium nitride where the X indicates how much of each is in there. So X equals 1 would mean it's all gallium nitride. X equals 0 means we have indium nitride. And so it's an alloy of indium nitride and gallium nitride. The value of X dictates the band gap. Here's an empirical expression for the band gap at room temperature as a function of how much of each element is in there. So when x equals 0 and you have just indium nitride, you have band gap, which is the band gap of indium nitride. And you can uh, let x equal 1 and calculate whatever that comes out to, and hopefully you'll get the band gap of gallium nitride. And so this is how you can get some control over the uh, band gap as a large adjustment range. I'll leave it for you to, to calculate what that is. This was a really useful advancement, uh, indium gallium nitride alloy because it enabled blue LEDs, which then became the citation for the 2014 Nobel Prize in Physics. Now you might wonder, why did the blue LED win a Nobel Prize in Physics? The reason is because that enabled white LED lighting, which then had a significant impact on the world. And that's one of the criteria that's often cited in Nobel Prizes. The second example is germanium silicide on a silicon substrate. Those go together. You start off with a silicon substrate, you expose it to germanium and vapor, and you get this germanium silicide, which is grown as a thin film on top of the silicon substrate. X, in this case, tells you how much of germanium and how much of silicon you have in that film. It's a very thin film, and we're using a strain technique here. So the thin film forms a strain layer. What that means is that the lattice of germanium silicide doesn't match to the lattice of the pure crystalline silicon substrate. So there's a strain that's put on the film and strain affects the band gap. You know, strain is, is really a stretching or a compressing of the crystal lattice. The band gap is determined by that lattice spacing and fundamental band theory. And so by having a strain in that film, the band gap is affected. And that strain is caused by the alloying ratio. The more germanium, the less silicon, the more strain there will be. In order to illustrate the relationship of strain, let's do a little aside here and talk about just silicon. I want to talk about the effect of temperature on silicon. The band gap of silicon varies with temperature and by this empirical relationship here. And the reason why it varies with temperature is because the thermal expansion of the lattice causes the spacing between the atoms to change. And that change in spacing causes a change in energy gap. That's just a phenomenon that you needed to be exposed to in order to really appreciate what's going on here. So now let's go back to germanium silicide. The empirical relationship for the band gap of germanium silicide begins with silicon because that's where x equals zero, that's all silicon, and then it changes from there as you start to add germanium. And what's happening as you add germanium is a change in the strain in the thin film. And that is what dominates the 
variation of the energy gap. Besides the fact that there's germanium present, that's a stronger contributor. Third example is aluminum gallium arsenide, where the aluminum and gallium ratio gets varied. I've shown here a phase diagram. A phase diagram implies that there are multiple phases being indicated, and the two phases being depicted in this diagram are the direct gap and the indirect gap semiconductor phases. And that's actually the topic for next time. So this is going to make more sense to you after, uh, after next time. Graph shows the band gap versus X. So on the left you have pure gallium arsenide, on the right you have pure aluminum arsenide. The band gap increases as you exchange gallium for aluminum. I've shown two curves. One is in the gamma direction and the other is in the X direction, which is not in the highest symmetry point. That's along the edge of a brilliant zone. And when the band gap in the gamma direction is the smallest value, you call that a direct gap semiconductor. When any other direction has a smaller band gap, you call that an indirect gap semiconductor. And that has an implication for optoelectronics, and it's all going to be revealed to you tomorrow. <laughs> But for now, I would just say that whatever is the lowest of the two is the actual band gap that we uh, think about. However, we could be thinking about the gamma direction as well if we provide high energy photons, for example, to make the transition. So I have these band gaps, and I can adjust them with the X ratio. Now that's useful. Look at the range. The range is fairly wide from about 1.42, which is pure gallium arsenide, up to you know, about 2.2. 6, which is pure aluminum arsenide. This material is useful in high electron mobility transistors, or MODFETs, modulation doped field effect transistors. You can take advantage of the fact that the aluminum gallium arsenide produces a lot of charge carriers because it's doped. The gallium arsenide, which is undoped, has a very high conductivity, but more importantly, it has a very high mobility. What that means is that electrons reach a high terminal velocity when they conduct through the gallium arsenide. And that's why this is useful for high speed transistors. The charge carriers are created in the, the doped aluminum gallium arsenide with this band gap that is controlled with the X ratio. And then they spill into the high purity gallium arsenide, which itself being pure is unable to generate charge carriers, but it just borrows them. And then those charge carriers move through the gallium arsenide much better because of the high mobility that they have in there. And that's why it's called a high electron mobility transistor. So we will be getting back to both direct and indirect band gaps next time. And much later, we will be getting back to modulation dope field effect transistors. The fourth example is a quaternary alloy. That is, there are four elements involved, gallium and indium and arsenic and phosphorus. The X controls the gallium and indium ratio, and the Y controls the arsenic to phosphorus ratio. And it actually looks like, if you look carefully, a combination of gallium arsenide and indium phosphide. And the energy gap actually can be tuned from the level it is for gallium arsenide to the level that it is for indium phosphide by judicious uh, choices of X and Y. So that's all I really have to say at this point about the, the quaternary alloys. But that summarizes my four examples of semiconductor alloys and band gap engineering with them. And the principles covered in each of these four examples are, are applicable actually in, in all of them. Uh, so hopefully we've been able to cover enough principles of band gap engineering that you have a sense of what it's about.